that <coughs> Take your Bibles, please, from the book of Judges. Judges in chapter 13. When you look through and you study God's Word, you realize that every passage has one meaning, but many different applications, many different ways to apply it. And I've <clears throat> been struggling all week with which direction God would have me go tonight. And honestly, we're not going to talk about Samson tonight, although he is the next judge in line. Um, we really only get to his parents. Um, and uh, John Gillespie had asked me earlier, what songs do you want to sing tonight? You know, what, which direction are you, are you going with your message? Is there anything particular you want to do? And I said, you know, just pick the song as the Lord leads and Go with the theme, do, do something, and I'm, I'm certain God's going to work it out for his honor and his glory. Well, we sing what? Near to the heart of God. Songs like that, which essentially is pretty, pretty much along the lines of what, what I'll be speaking about tonight. Uh, kind of separation unto God and, and service for God and for others. So you kind of got it. It kind of read my mind before I did. <laughs> So, uh, I guess with no further ado, let's look at Judges chapter 13. <clears throat> and we'll start there in verse number 1. And we'll read through verse number 5. Judges chapter 13. <clears throat> the Bible says this, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines, Forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Let's pray together. Lord God and Heavenly Father, thank you again for this evening. Thank you for those who are present. Pray now that you would help as we study your word. <coughs> Show us things that are applicable to our, unto our lives. Help us to be changed by the power of your word, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Bear with me for a second. You model people you admire. I admire Mr. Bo, so. <laughs> I'm going to cough a little, I'm going to drink a little, and we'll hopefully, hopefully get through tonight. Um, <coughs> we've uh, looked at several judges, Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Barak, Gideon, Tola, Jair, Jephthah, and we kind of skipped over uh, Ibzon, Elon, and Abdon, which are interesting names, uh, but you see them there in the end of chapter 12, starting in verse 8. Uh, the Bible doesn't have much to say about them. They're kind of all contained within um, uh, seven or eight verses there, all three of those guys. The Bible basically just says that those three were judges and they judged Israel. And then along comes Samson. And in, verse, uh, in chapter 13, and for a couple of chapters, we begin to learn about this man Samson. Now, last time I preached on the judges, we were talking about Jephthah, and I made a statement kind of like, you see how these people are less and less like God. You've got Othniel, who was a really good example of what he should be, uh, Ehud and Shamgar, and then you've got Deborah and Barak, and Deborah's doing these judicial duties. Why? Uh, probably because there's no man to do it. 
Then you have Barak who says, well, I'll, I'll go to war if you go with me, Deborah. <coughs> and uh, God had spoken directly to Barak, and yet he was still afraid to do or was unwilling to do what he was supposed to do unless Deborah uh, went with him. And she did, and they were successful. And then you've got Gideon, who was, uh, his father was the leader of idol worship in, in their town there. And Gideon, um, when you read through the end of his life, you see that uh, he made an ephod, and the children of Israel, the Bible says, went a whoring after it. And he had some trouble, some real trouble. He had a, he had a lot of kids and he had a concubine, and her son, Abimelech, went through and slaughtered all of Gideon's kids. And so he had some real trouble with that guy. And then you get to Jephthah, a guy who was born of a harlot and was cast out of his own city, and comes back and, and is kind of, uh, uh, kind of speaks before he talks uh, and doesn't really think things all the way through. And so you see God using people, but they're not perfect people, which... I think is, is, is a testament to how the children of Israel were living, and yet there's still hope in that statement. Because none of us are perfect. My wife tells me she is, but uh, the rest of us, no, I'm kidding, she, she doesn't. Man, I'm in trouble now. None of us are perfect, and yet God still sees fit to use us to accomplish his will, to do his work for his honor and his glory. And in chapter 13, we see the beginning of that judge's cycle. Remember, we've got sin, then slavery, then supplication, then salvation, then silence, except something is different this time. The Bible starts out in chapter 13, verse, verse 1, same way it has many times for the book of Judges, and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. There's the sin. And here's the slavery. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. By the way, this is twice as long as any other oppression they've been under so long, or so far. So there is the slavery. Now we're missing something this time. There's no supplication. The children of Israel are not crying out unto the Lord. What's happened? What's happened? Well, over the years... Children of Israel, they slide a little bit away from where they're supposed to be. And God draws them back, and they come back almost where they're supposed to be. And then they slide a little bit more. God calls them back. He draws them to him. And they kind of come back a little, but not all the way. And now they're even further. And now you have them all the way over here. And they don't even realize that they need God's help. They, they don't even realize. In fact, when you look at the whole story of Samson, the Israelites and the Philistines, they're not really fighting with each other, so to, so to speak. They're, they're like living with each other. And they've slipped so far away from God that they don't even understand that they need salvation. This is not my message, but man, it'll preach. When we go away from God, and we continue to move away from God. He draws us back. And when we don't give him our all and come back with everything, the next time we slide away, we slide further, and we slide further, and we slide further, to where we don't even realize that we're in need of what God has. I said that wasn't my message. Well, it, well, it is kind of. And, you know, you look at, you look at this book, and, and sometimes I think... Uh, you're tempted to think, well, what does God want from these people? I, I jotted this down really first. What is, what is, uh, really fast, what does God want from his children? God wants us to love him. God wants us to listen to him. He wants us to live for him, and he wants us to look for him. And I think I got that as I was reading through this text, all, all those different things that you can see in the lives of, of uh, Manoah and his wife. Um, that's not my message either. Uh, I'm going to get to it eventually tonight, I promise. God spoke here through the angel of the Lord. Spoke unto Manoah's wife. By the way, she's not mentioned. I've got a lot of rabbit trails tonight. We don't know her name at all, do we? Would seem like she's a pretty insignificant character, right? No, she's not. She's pretty significant. It's the mother of Samson here. Um, listen, fame isn't everything. 
I know we, we live our lives and we're tempted to live our lives as I want to go down in history. And you know what? I don't know who led me to Christ, but I know somebody did. And their name is not written down in my history, but they're an important part of my history. And maybe you know people like that also. Or maybe you're like that to someone. Maybe you've led people to Christ. They have no idea who you are. Fame's not everything. Her name's not even mentioned here. God's speaking to Manoah's wife. And he, he told her here in verse 4, verse 4 and 5 is really where I want to stay, where I want to kind of hover for the rest of our time. <clears throat> he tells her exactly how to raise Samson. He was specific in the instructions he gave. God wanted to do great things through Samson. But it was going to be up to his parents to keep him for a time. They would be responsible for making sure he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. By the way, when we get to chapter 14, we've got a little gap in between the end of 13 and 14. Um, uh, because in verse 24, it says that the woman bare a son, called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And then in verse 14, we see Samson is now wanting a wife. Now, he's, he's not just born and wanting a wife, okay? There's several years in between there. And I believe firmly that when Samson was under the care of his parents, they did a pretty good job of raising him the way they were supposed to. Uh, Samson had many other issues that we're not even going to get to go into tonight. Uh, but nonetheless, his parents did a pretty good job of raising him. <coughs> God's instructions to Samson's mother are still important today. If we do what God says, he can use us for whatever he wants. If we obey his commands, we position ourselves in such a way that we're always ready to do his will. And that's how we need to live, like we're always ready to do his will. So what did God demand of Samson? What did he tell his mother that he demanded of him? And what does God demand of us? I'll answer the question, then we'll look at each point separately. First of all, God demands our separation. Secondly, God demands our service. And those are two things we're going to talk about tonight, separation and service. Um, uh, look at verse 4. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine or strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Nazarite. The word Nazarite comes from the Hebrew Nazir, which means to separate or consecrate. Separate or consecrate. The Nazarite vow consisted of three rules, if you will. No grapes. <clears throat> no cutting your hair. No touching dead stuff. Okay? Uh, I wish that I was keeping the no cutting your hair part, but my sides grew out and I kind of look like Bozo the Clown, so I got to cut it. <laughs> Many people have suggested maybe I should grow it out and then comb it over, but my hair just doesn't do that. I wish that it did. It does not. Uh, but those were the three rules, if you will, for a Nazarite. No grapes. And, of course, that, uh, that was no wine, uh, no raisins, you know, anything grapes are used for, not even the seed of the grape, not the husk of the grape, none of that. Don't touch it at all. Um, don't cut your hair, and don't touch any dead stuff, like dead people and animals, dead carcasses. Okay? A Nazarite was to be separated and consecrated. Samson was supposed to be different. It's what God told his mother. Your son is going to be different. <clears throat> God wants his children to be different. That's you and I. He wants us to be different from the world around us. Not only does he desire us to separate from the world, but he also desire us, desires us to separate unto him, to grow closer to him. Uh, but he also wants us to be totally removed from the world. Now, I told this story before, and I think this is Mr. Ensemble's favorite story that I tell, but let me tell it again. When I was in college, I was a rollerblader. You guys know what rollerblades are? Yeah, stay away from them, they're dangerous. Okay? And uh, we would rollerblade around uh, campus until they, they outlawed that and said you can't do that anymore. And we still did it, and we would go. We would go across our, our college campus, and, and up on the hill was <coughs> Watertown High. We loved to go up there because they had a huge parking lot, little speed bumps, 
we could do tricks, pretend like we were really cool. <clears throat> we rollerblade all the time. And uh, as, as you left Watertown High, there's a huge hill going down. There was a really wide sidewalk, so you didn't have to rollerblade on, on the street. And if you got going fast enough down this hill, when you came up the other side, you could make it all the way up without too much work. And uh, so we would, you know, s several of us, six or eight of us, we'd, we'd go down and we'd, we'd try to go back up the other side. Anyway, we, we realized one time that, that the sum of all of us working together was greater than just one person working by himself. And so we started um, doing this thing that we like to call the train. And the train is where we would all line up behind each other. We would grab each other's belt loops or, or uh, hold on, and we would all push together and stay in a straight line. And we would get up so much speed, and I'm talking about speed. I mean, when you got something this large rolling down a hill, <laughs> it's gonna pick up speed. And we'd go whip down this hill, and by the time we were coming up to the other side, we'd be almost all the way to the top before any of us ever did anything. We'd just be rolling along. And we did this all the time. We loved doing it. It was a blast. Well, it was a stupid thing to do. We didn't know it at the time, but uh, it happened that one night we decided to go rollerblading, and we did, decided to bring along the new guy. And he stole his roommate's rollerblades and decided to come with us. He wasn't really that good. We didn't know he wasn't that good at rollerblading until we decided to do the train. Now, I, I honestly don't know whose idea it was to stick this guy at the front of the line. Um, it was probably mine. <laughs> We stick this guy up front. He's like the second one in line. And uh, we start pushing down this hill. And we're starting to pick up speed. And I, I still remember it. See this guy starting to get a little shaky. And there he goes. He goes down. Now, he didn't just fall. He fell and laid across the sidewalk. <laughs> now, we're, we're going really fast. And... And uh, the guy who was up front told me later that when this guy fell, he had hold of his belt loops. <laughs> and he lost his pants. And they were, <coughs> of course, down around his rollerblades. <coughs> and he had to uh, skate himself to a stop at the top of the hill and before he could get his pants back up. But the rest of us hit this guy and all fell over him. And I remember hitting the guy. And the next thing I remember was about 15 minutes later, and there was a flash of light. No, it wasn't me going toward the light. It was a cop, and he was sitting up in the parking lot. He'd watched the whole thing. And uh, I remember I'm laying on my back, and I see this light, and I, I kind of come to, and I remember a voice saying, yep, this one's got to go to the hospital. <laughs> and that one was me. And I remember the ambulance came, and... And uh, then I remember arriving at the hospital. I don't remember much in between. I was kind of in and out of it. But uh, I lost half of my face over here. Um, you think I'm ugly now. You should have seen me then. Uh, this half of my face was gone. I, I lost uh, some skin on my arms. And I, I had a tough time walking for a while. I, I was on crutches because I bruised my left femur. Femur bone is huge. It's hard to bruise. But uh, I did. And then... I realized something, I was missing something else, something that I was very fond of. It wasn't my watch, even though I did lose that. I, I was missing some teeth. Uh, apparently, the guy in front of me, uh, when he jumped as I was falling, may, I don't know, maybe his, his skate made contact with my face uh, because I was missing three of my front teeth. And those teeth, let me tell you, were gone. I don't know if I swallowed them, I don't know if they were planted in the grass next to Watertown High. I don't know if there's a tree that grows there now in my honor. I, I don't know. They're, the point is this. They're gone. They're totally removed. I will never find them again. They are totally separate from my body. Forever. Listen, when it comes to the world, we need to be totally separate from the world. Now, I didn't lose my whole teeth. One of them I kind of did. But the other two were kind of broken in half. So I lost the bottom half of them. Well, guess what's still in the top half? The root, somebody says. I could not eat or drink anything for three or four days until I could get into the dentist and have some emergency 
dental surgery. I still have fake teeth to this day. Uh, well, I'm forever going to have fake teeth. I can't have my real ones back. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You got some fake ones, too. I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but you know who you are. Listen, the point is this. There was a little bit left there, and what did it do? It hurt immensely. Listen, when we leave a little bit of the world, when we don't separate totally from the world, it's going to hurt you immensely. It is going to come back, and it is going to be like we read in the Bible, that root of bitterness springing up, and it's going to bother you, and it's going to take its toll on you, and if you leave that root there, you're going to fail. You need to be totally separated from the world. Look at the life of Samson. Was he totally separated from the world? No, he was not. Was he supposed to be? Yes, he was. Can you imagine what great things God would have done with Samson had he been totally separated from the world? God did great things with Samson, and he wasn't totally separated from the world. You know what Samson did. All these, these acts, these mighty acts that he did, can you imagine what God would have done? If Samson would have lived like he was supposed to live. Can you imagine what God would do with you if you would live like you're supposed to live? Can you imagine the great things God could possibly do in your life if you'll just totally separate yourself from the world? Listen, the world is this, in a nutshell. The world is society apart from God or society without God. That's what we need to come away from. That's what we need to, to come apart from. That's what we need to stay away from. I know we have a tendency to think, do I really have to give it my all? Do I really have to put my whole self into it? I don't think I can do that. And I think sometimes we even say, I think it's unfair of God to ask me to do that or to expect me to do that. Everyone else does it. Why should I have to be different? A story was told of a man who built a house, built a, a mansion, five, six bedrooms, and it was just a beautiful house. One day, a man and his wife were walking by, and they stood there admiring the house. And the, and the gentleman who built it came out, and he said, are you admiring my house? And, and the man and the wife said, yeah, we love it. We would love to have a house like this one day. And this man says this. He says, you know what? I'll give you this house. The guy says, well, what do I have to do? How much do you want for it? I mean, wait, there's no way we can afford a house this beautiful. And the man says, you know what? I will give you this house. I'll give it to you for free for nothing. No money, nothing. It's free and clear, paid for. And the wife begins to get excited. Well, what do we got to do? What, what is it that you want from us? Well, I don't want anything from you. I'll show you what I want. Come over here. So he shows him <coughs> right outside the house on the porch. There's a nail right above the door of the house. And he says, I'll give you this entire house, but I want that nail. I want to own that nail. Don't pull that nail out. If you can do that, I'll give you this house. Man and the wife are ecstatic. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you at all. Just let me keep that nail. Don't pull it out. Don't mess with it. It's my nail. No problem. Man moves out of the house. The man and the wife move into the house, and it's their house. They spend years there. And their kids are raised in that house. And they love their house. And the man comes back one day. He knocks on the door. He said, oh, I suppose you want your house back. No, I don't want my house. I just want to use the nail. Oh, no problem. That's your nail. It's still there. This man took, and he hung up on this nail, a dead dog. Something he'd pulled off the street. And he hung it up on that nail over their door. They looked, and... Oh, that's, that's an odd thing. But you know what? It's his nail. He can do whatever he wants with it. The carcass of this dog began to rot and began to smell and it began to fester. Pretty soon, every time the man and the wife opened the door of their house, they didn't even have to open their door. The smell permeated their entire house to the point where this house was unlivable for them. It was unlivable for their family. Nobody wanted to visit. They had to leave the house point is this. You leave Satan this much of your life. He's going to take it and he's going to use it for total ruin. And you are going to hate what he does with this much of your life. 
Listen, we need to be totally separated from the world. Let me say it again. Imagine the great things Samson could have done if he would have been totally separated from the world. Separation involves so much more than an outward conformity. It requires an inward change as well. <clears throat> the Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Many of us smile on the outside, but on the inside, we're bitter. Many of us are happy on the outside, but on the inside, we're hateful. Many of us are laughing on the outside, but on the inside, we're liars. We're deceivers. That is a very hypocritical way to live. Question is, are you separated from the world? Are you truly different from the world in word and in thought and in action? I hope you are. Because if you're not, you're going to struggle with God using you. You're not going to be ready for him to use you. You're not going to be able to be used as long as you're giving over even this much to the world and sin. Don't do it. Be separate from the world. God demands our separation. Secondly, God demands our service. Look at the end of verse 5 there in our text. <coughs> angel of the Lord says, The child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. What was Samson supposed to do? He was to begin to deliver Israel. He was supposed to work for them. His job was to loose the chains the Israelites were bound by and to open their eyes to all that God had for them. He was to serve the Israelites as a judge. God wants us to serve also. He wants us to look beyond ourselves. He wants us to consider others before ourselves. We live in a world that's consumed with self. Everywhere you go, every philosophy you hear that this world has to offer has to do with you yourself. My wife taught a couple of years in public school in Michigan, Fenton, Michigan. And I tell you what, it was a pretty good school because a lot of the kids she found out were Christian kids and were good Christian kids. And uh, they'd come to her and they talked to her about Christian matters, religious matters, which, by the way, you're allowed to talk about if the kids initiate it. They'd ask her questions about the Bible. It was great. She really liked it. But you know what the philosophy was for the teachers? And these teachers' meetings that she went to and her mentors, it was look out for number one. Always worry about yourself. Always watch out for number one. The world is consumed with self and not serving others, serving yourself. But God requires his people to forget self and to focus on others, to be servants. God requires Self-denial. You know what self-denial is? Let's look at God's word and let's see what God's word has to say about self-denial and will be done. So we're going to turn to a couple passages here and I hope that you'll stay with me. Luke chapter 14, please. Self-denial is a condition of discipleship. First of all, Luke chapter 14 and verse 33. The Bible says this, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Listen, we've got to put ourselves out of the way if we want to be a disciple. Self-denial is a condition of discipleship. Secondly, go to Matthew chapter 16. We'll look at several of these here. Nine to be exact. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24 Self-denial involves conquering selfish desires. Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 24. And then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, please. Philippians 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and chapter 3. Self-denial involves counting all but loss. The Bible says this, Yea, doubtless, and I count all but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Romans chapter 13, please. <coughs> Self-denial creates no condition for fleshly fulfillment. Romans chapter 13 and verse 14 says this, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make, make not provision for the flesh, to fulfill the lusts thereof. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Self-denial involves crucifying the flesh. 1 Peter 2.11 says this. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the souls. Also, Galatians 5.24. Along those same lines. Galatians 5.24 says this. <clears throat> and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Look please at Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, and ordinary affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. <coughs> Self-denial involves crucifying the flesh. Six, it involves casting off the old man. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, says this, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, the lusts. Number seven, it involves conformity to Christ, not the world. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, number eight, it involves the cross being taken up. Look at Matthew chapter 10, please. Matthew 10 and verse 38. And he that taketh not his cross and falleth after me is not worthy of me. And number nine, self-denial involves crediting the Lord with honor and glory. John 3.30 says he must increase, I must decrease. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In verse 29 and verse 31, that no flesh should glory in his presence. And look at verse 31, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Self-denial involves crediting the Lord with honor and glory. How are you doing at denying yourself? How are you doing at serving others? How are you doing at serving Christ? Remember, the world doesn't want you to do that. The world wants you to serve you. Well, how are you doing, doing the opposite? How is your separation? Do you long for the things of this world? Or do you long for the things of God? How is your service? Do you long to serve yourself and your own needs? Or do you long to serve others and their needs? Listen, Samson was raised right. But when he had the opportunity to make decisions, he made poor decisions. He made bad decisions. He wasn't separated. He wasn't serving. I trust that we as God's children, having the written word of God, the completed form of the written word of God, having direct communion with God through his word and through prayer, I trust that we can live according to how he wants us to live. I know it's not easy. I know it's tough. But listen, if we'll trust God, he'll see us through. How are you doing with separation? How are you doing with service? Hopefully, you're doing pretty well. Let's pray. God, thank you again for our time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the things that we can learn from your word. Thank you for being a God who loves us, who desires to see what's best for us. 
But God, you want us to be separated from the world. Oh God, help us to separate from the world and sin. Help us to come away from the world. and Touch not that unclean thing. Help us to be separated unto you. God, help us to meditate upon your precepts, to think about your word, to fill our mind with all that you have for us so that we can grow closer to you every day. And God, help us to see the need to serve, not ourselves. Help us to see the need to serve others around us. Help us the need to see the need to serve you and what you want for us. God, help, don't, help us not to be selfish. Help us to be selfless. Now, God, I pray that if there's some here struggling with the matter of separation, that you'd convict them of their sin. They'd get it right tonight. God, I pray that if, you, uh, if there's some here that are uh, convicted of, of uh, their need to serve others, that you would convict them of that. God, help them to look for ways to serve you, to serve others above themselves. That God bless us as, as uh, we go from this place tonight. Help us to remember the things that we learned from your word uh, this morning and this evening so that we can grow closer to you throughout this week. God, bring us back here safely uh, Wednesday and next Sunday. Help us to continue all week to grow in your word. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.